Howdy roofers and welcome to a very special episode that we have for roofingsites.com. We have a very special guest on today to talk about how to implement Profit First into your roofing company. I have on here uh, Greg Martin, the entrepreneur's banker, my co-host on Aggie Growth Hacks and a really close friend of mine. Thank you so much for coming on, Greg. Thank you, Chris. I'm so excited to be here. Howdy roofers. Uh, first off, let me say thank you for all the hard work that you do. Uh, we have had a couple uh, storms here in Texas over the last couple of years. And without you roofers, uh, there'd be a whole lot of leaky roofs. So I know that running your business is hard. I know that finding clients is hard. And I also know that holding on to cash at the end of the day is hard. So thank you, Chris, for allowing me to come alongside and share a little bit about Profit First and how we can make sure that your roofing business is permanently profitable. Awesome. Let's let's really pay attention here because what we're talking about today is very important for every single roofing business. And no, this has absolutely nothing to do with marketing. This has everything to do with building and growing your roofing company, which by the way, my big, hairy, audacious goal is to double the size of 100 roofing companies by 2028. So this is just one small part one small way that I am uh, working on on bringing in very special guests that know things that you probably don't, right? So profit first is a is a huge driver, can be a huge driver in the growth of your roofing company. All right. So thank you so much for coming on, Greg. And I will let you just go ahead and share your screen and let's kick this off. Uh, well, roofers, again, thank you so much for allowing me to come speak with you. I am Greg Martin. I am the Entrepreneur's Banker. I am one of two certified Profit First bankers in the entire world. If y'all have not heard of Profit First, um, I encourage you to connect with me or just Google it at the very least. What it is is a cash management methodology that was created by a business author named Mike Michalowicz. Now, Mike Michalowicz, if you have not heard about him, you definitely need to. Um, and this is a huge shout out to Chris because I didn't hear of Mike Michalowicz before uh, Chris introduced me to him. But at the end of the day, roofers, if you want to have a business and you want to have a business that is permanently profitable, this is a system that you can use that guarantees it. It is a simple system. As we walk through today, we're going to talk high level but it is not necessarily the easiest system to implement. So we're going to kind of walk through some things. And the thing that I love about Profit First is that it can be 100% tailored to your business. However you do business, however you mentally look at money and however you run your business, we can set this up so that it is customized to you so that it helps you. Because if it doesn't help you, it's not effective to you. It's not, it doesn't come natural to you, then it's not going to be a tool that you use to the maximum efficiency. And, and what I would say is that any roofer that has been in business for more than a year knows the saying or should know the saying that income is vanity, profit is sanity. I don't care if you're a $200,000 a year roofer or a $20 million a year roofer. What I care about is the cash that you have at the end of the day after all your materials have been paid for, after all your, your employees have been paid for, after all the expenses have been paid for, after what you deserve to take out of the business has been paid for, you have to have profit at the end of the day. And so we're going to walk through that and we're going to kind of do that. And I, I'm going to do that in a way of talking about the Murph Challenge. So this is a picture of me and a good buddy, Chris and I, Jason Beasley. So uh, Chris is an Air Force veteran. Jason and I are both Army veterans. And about two or three years ago, Jason challenged me to do the Murph Challenge with him. And so for, uh, for all of y'all that aren't familiar with what the Murph Challenge is, it's actually named after one of our fa fallen heroes, uh, a Navy SEAL that, um, that is a Medal of Honor winner. And so every year, this is a fundraiser that we do in his name and his honor. And you run a mile or walk. I don't run a whole lot anymore, but you run a mile. You do 100 pull-ups. You do 200 push-ups. You do 300 squats. And you run another mile. And you do it all by while wearing a 20-pound vest. 
So it is definitely not for the faint of heart, and it takes a lot of work to actually work up to it. And Jason and I actually started training about a year in advance for the first time that we, we did the Murph, um, and you, you'll kind of see it there, of what our times were in uh, 21 and 22. So what in the world does the principles of Profit First have to do with, with the Murph? I mean, one is a business methodology of managing cash, and the other is a crazy, insane exercise. Well, the principles are you start off, you have to watch what you eat, or you have to have portion control. All right. When we're training for this, you don't you don't sit there and eat ho hos and ding dongs every day. You got to watch what you eat. You got to eat the right amount of it. I can't I can't have twenty pounds of pasta every day. So you have to watch what you eat and you have to, to control it. You have to consistently work out. You have to have muscle memory, in which Jason and I did for over a year in order to be, even prepare ourselves for for the Murph. You have to remove temptation, and uh, we'll talk about how this happens in your business, temptation to spend money, but you actually have to remove temptation so that you can maximize where your cash goes. And then we're going to celebrate every victory that you have because this is, this is managing money and managing cash in your business is probably 95% mental and how you approach it. And so and when you have victories, you need to celebrate that. You need to celebrate that with your team. And so you need to, to make sure that you, you have that positive reinforcement. And then finally, you have to have an airborne buddy. Both, both Jason and I uh, served in airborne units. I served with the 82nd Airborne Division. So I was one of those crazy guys that jumped out of the airplane. Uh, Jason was in an air assault unit. So he was one of the crazy guys that went around uh, in a helicopter. But you've got to have a buddy. You've got to have someone to actually help you through this. Okay, so the first core principle is you've got to watch what you eat. And this is, this is taken directly from Parkinson's Law. And Parkinson's Law basically states that any activity that you do will increase to consume all of the assets or all of the resources that are available to you. So in the picture that, that we've got here, um, I've got three plates. And it's got a lovely salmon dinner on each one of those plates. But what will you notice? That, that when you go and you eat, eat you're going to pile on as much as you can on that plate. And, you know, when I was raised, it was, you know, you're going to clean your plate and I don't care. You know, there, there are kids in Africa that are starving and they would give, give their left leg to, to eat that. Oh, I always wanted to kind of ship it over to them and share the, <laughs> share the wealth, but I never did. But the, the point of that story is that if you have something on your plate, then you're going to clean it. You're going to eat it all. You're going to consume all the assets that are on your plate. So if you are looking to get in shape, you have to shrink what you eat. You have to shrink the size of your plate so that you can't put as much on your plate. This is the same thing when you think about with your business. And this is, this is one of the core principle of Profit First, one of the hardest ones. Think, think about it this way. When you have a brand new tube of toothpaste, you know, and you're going to brush your teeth in the morning. You can slather a big old chunk of toothpaste on there. And if it rolls off into the sink, ah, no big deal. I've got plenty on it. I'll just keep putting more on and keep putting more on and keep putting more on. But if you're at the end of your toothpaste, if you're at the very, very end and you, you know, like you've got like pliers or something that you're, you know, scraping, you know, you actually cut the bottom of the toothpaste out. So you scrape the toothpaste tube out. What's that telling you? That is telling you that you're still going to accomplish the task. You're going to accomplish the task of brushing your teeth, whether that's with a big old tube. If you got a lot of toothpaste, you'll use a lot. If you have a little bit of toothpaste, you're going to use a teeny tiny pea-sized uh, bit of toothpaste. Your business is the same way. If you allow it to, your business will consume all of the cash that you put into it. If you allow it to, You'll find a way to spend all of the cash that you make. And so what you have to do is you have to start to shrink the plate. You have to start shrinking and, and telling your business, no, you cannot spend all of that cash on buying a new piece of equipment, or you cannot spend all of that cash on investing in inventory. You cannot spend all of that cash by hiring another crew. You have to shrink what it is. And, and as entrepreneurs, there's a lot of good things that you can do with your cash, 
but you if you don't control it, you'll find a way to spend it. And so that's that's the first law. All right. In the in the way that we so let's talk about the the general overview of the profit first system. All right. And when it comes down to it, a lot of entrepreneurs have one bank account and they have one bank account and so they pull up if if they've got some type of if they they have an opportunity to spend some money someone's approached them about either some type of sponsorship or maybe buying some new equipment or doing something they're going to pull up that bank account they're going to look to say yep i've got money in it i'll go ahead and spend it but that's not what profit first does what profit first does we actually have for 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 roofer businesses I would recommend that you would have six accounts. And if, if you're looking online, um, th- this presentation, um, it, it, it's not updated 100%, but we're going to customize this for roofers. All right. The first account we're going to have is the income account. All right. And that's where all the money goes into. So every time you get a draw, that money's going to go into that income account. Then for roofers, we're going to have an, an account that I call mats and subs or materials and subcontractors. Okay. And we'll, we'll talk, uh, that we'll talk about how that all works out. But, but in the mats and subs account, that is where you're going to put a portion of every draw that you get over into that account to make sure that your materials and your subcontractors are paid. Because that's the most critical part of your business is the materials and the subcontractors that you work with. And then, then we're going to have four other accounts. Um, one, the first one's going to be your, your profit account. And in that profit account, that's where you're going to keep your profit, you know, profit first. You know, we're going to make sure that we put money in that account first. Two, we're going to have a tax account because every entrepreneur has a silent partner. I, I call him, uh, I call Uncle Sam kind of like a patriotic Tony Soprano. He he he's there and he just he just wants a taste. I just want a taste of your business. I don't want all your business. I just want a taste of your business. And you're gonna have to pay your your patriotic partner, Uncle Sam. So you better make sure that, that ta- you've got money to pay for him. And then your the the fourth account that we're gonna have is the owner's compensation account. And you let me let me get serious right here. You entrepreneur are the most important employee in the business. I don't care if you have the best run roofing company, one that you can step away for an entire month and all the bills get paid, you bring on new clients, you take care of clients, all issues are dealt with. If you were to get hit by a beer truck, you in your business would not survive because only you entrepreneur, have the vision of where you want your company to go. It might run perfectly fine, but you are the most important person, the most important employee for that, that, that reason alone. And because of that, you need to make sure that your compensation is taken care of, that you have enough money to run your household. Because if you don't have enough money to run your household, then what you are, you have a very, very, very expensive hobby. One that you are working probably 120 hours a week at, super stressed out about, and not making any money in. That's a hobby. You need to have a business that compensates you for taking the risk, that compensates you for being willing to lay it all on the line, that compensates you for being the most important employee. And then the last account that we're going to have is going to be an OPEX account or an operating account. And that's when that's the, where everything else is paid for. If you have uh, personnel that aren't uh, subcontractors that work with you, they get paid out of the OPEX. If you have, you know, you're working with Chris and, you know, there are marketing costs in order to grow and have your business, it comes out of the operating account. Your utilities, your gas, your insurance, all that stuff, it all comes out of, out of the operating account. And every single one of these is a separate account at a bank. Okay, so before I go on, are there any questions about this? I know this is a little bit different. Having six or seven accounts as a business, are there any questions out there? One of the ones here that really resonates is how much, what percentage goes into each of these accounts? And are these all at the same bank? Will banks even set up all of these accounts? Yep. Okay, so so I'll kind of take that in, in reverse order. So. 
Uh, yes. So, so your bank should be able to set up multiple accounts. Um, you may have, uh, you may have some banks or bankers that when you walk in, they say, why do you want to have seven accounts? That's going to be a nightmare reconciling, reconciling everything that doesn't make sense. The fact of the matter is, is that they're not certified profit first bankers. You know, I'm one of two in the world. So you need to, you need to be able to, to talk to it and you may have to educate them a little bit on what profit first is. Also, you need to make sure that you're asking them, okay, do, am I going to have any fees associated with these accounts? Because, and there are a lot of banks out there that allow you to have multiple accounts open and they don't charge you fees. And so if your bank is one of the ones that, you know, you have to have X amount of dollars in every account in order to not have fees, then you need to take that in consideration. But let me tell you, there are a lot of banks out there that do not have fees associated with, with these accounts. And then as, as far as the, 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 the majority of all these accounts are at one bank, uh, we'll talk in, in just a second about two other accounts, a profit uh, hold and a tax hold account. That has to do what we talked about removing temptation. We'll talk about that in just a second. But the heart of what you're asking for, uh, asking, asking about is what, how much do I put in each one of these accounts? And the fact of the matter is, is that, that we can set that up initially, but then we're going to grow and we're going to expand that. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Let's talk about working out. Um, when you work out, you have muscle memory. You know, when I was working out from the Murph and, and challenged for that, I mean, sitting there doing pull up after pull up after pull up, you know, your, your back and your arm muscles just get accustomed to doing that. And it's, it's just all that constant repetition, repetition. The same thing happens in the profit first world. So you have your income account again. And that's an account that's, that, that's at the bank and all the money that you get goes into that account. And there's, there's not, you, you do not put money into your business in anything other than that income account. Everything goes in there. And then the, the book talks about knowing your business. And so on the 12th, excuse me, on the 10th and the 25th, it talks about saying, okay, well, we want to, to go ahead and make the allocation of cash into these different accounts. I'm going to sit here, I'm going to argue that that probably does not make sense for roofers. And the reason that I say that is that roofers probably don't get consistently paid on the first of every month. You probably submit draws on the first of every month, but you don't get paid in a consistent manner. And so we're not gonna necessarily, I mean, if, if you get to the point where you understand the, the 10th and the 25th, and you get to that point that you have that consistent cash coming in, that you could do the allocations on the 10th and the 25th, that's great. But really, what I would say is that the money comes in and then immediately you do the allocations, all right? Or the, the next day, once the, the money actually is in your account. And so what I would say is that when we're talking about the different allocations and how much you put in each account, it depends on your particular business. So let's just, let's just go and let, let's assume you have a $10 million a year roofing company. And when you look back, you consistently say that 50% of your revenue is spent on either subcontractors or materials. Well, I would sit there and I would argue you don't have a $10 million revenue company. You have a $5 million revenue company that just happens to also subcontract out $5 million worth of work in materials and subs. And so if you let's uh, I'm I'm a banker, so I'm gonna keep this super simple because I don't have a calculator, so I can't do math. I'm very, very, very simple. So if you get a hundred thousand dollar draw, then you would immediately or the next day you would immediately put fifty percent or fifty thousand dollars into your materials and subs account. And then when it comes time to to make your payments to your materials houses or when it comes time to make your payment to your subcontractors, you have that money that's already set aside, that's already worked there. Now, personally, I think that you, as you go through it, because you guys know much better than I, but you guys know that getting draws on time is extremely difficult because there's so many factors that are beyond your control that goes into that draw. You know, when you're working with a general contractor, they're not just pulling in your, your invoice. 
They've got 12 other subs that they're working with and they're pulling all those together and then they turn around and, and issue a, a draw request to either the owner or a bank. And from my perspective, my, with my banking hat on, I know exactly how that process goes from my perspective. I'm a banker. I'm not a construction guy. I don't know that when you hand me a draw that says, yes, we've done $100,000 worth of roofing, that that's actually been done. I mean, I could go out and I could look at the building and be like, yep, the roof's there. I don't know if it, I mean, if, I, if I'm really adventurous, I might actually get up and walk on the roof and be like, yep, the shingles are there. I don't know that. So what do I do? I turn around and I go, I dispatch an inspector, or, you know, an engineer or an architect or somebody else to take two or three days to go out and actually look at the plans, look at what you've done, understand how much of a, okay, are we 10% done with this line item? Are we 50%, 75%? Do we have enough, you know, with what has to get done? Do you have enough in the budget to still finish that? And then that person comes back to the bank and says, yep, they asked for $100,000 in uh, for, the, for the roof expense, along with $300,000 of landscaping and plumbing and electric, all that stuff together. So then I fund the draw. If everything works out right and we've got that contractor, you know, he's got all the paperwork ready. So from me, from the time I get a request to the time that my money actually, uh, or the client's money actually goes from the loan into the contractor's account, that could be, that in and of itself could take two or three weeks, depending on how difficult that is. And if you as the roofing contractor are probably on a pay when paid schedule with the GC, the GC is not going to take money out of their pocket to give to you. So as you're walking through that, you probably need to sit there and think about, okay, that mats and subs account, that material and subcontractor account. I can't tell my guys, I'm going to pay you whenever I get paid. You know, that, that's how you get cash in, but that's not necessarily how you get cash out. Now, if you can negotiate that with your subs, definitely do that. That helps. And you probably sit there and you can negotiate some terms with your supply houses on getting that inventory. And if you can get a paid one paid on the inventory, then do that. That helps work in capital. But if you don't, then you're going to need a little bit extra cushion in that mats and subs account to allow you to be flexible, to allow you to pay your subs on time, every time, every single week. Because if you could do that, if you can make sure that you're paying your supply houses at or before the terms that they extend to you, then when you and 10 other of your competitors are going to these subs to say, hey, I've got a job for you, which one of the subs is going to come work for? They're going to come work for you because you pay them on time, you pay them without delay, and you're, you're financially strong to be able to do that. When you sit there and you pay your supply houses at or before the 30 or 45 or 60 days that they give you, what does that tell them? That tells them that you're a good entrepreneur. You've, you are financially strong. You're not necessarily a thousand percent dependent upon somebody else to pay it before you take care of your obligations. And what does that allow you to do? That allows you to extend credit. That allows you to go from, you know, cash on the barrel when you're trying to get inventory or supplies to maybe 30 days out to 60 days out, 90 days out, 120 days out. And if you can do that and extend the amount of credit and extend the amount of time that you have with your supply houses, then that's going to help increase flexibility in your business and it's going to help. So that's where I say, okay, so you get $100,000 and you put it in the income account and you immediately take 50% of that or $50,000 and you, you move it over. So then what you have left over, what you have left over is what the book calls real revenue, or that's the revenue that you can run your business on. Okay. And then that's the revenue that you split up between your profit account, your tax account, your owner's compensation account, and your OPEX. All right. So let's, so let me just kind of walk through um, something that's from a percentage standpoint. And then let's, let's just kind of put some real numbers to this. So you've got $100,000 that went into your income account, $50,000 went over, and that's in your, that's in your uh, materials and subs account. So then you're going to take 10% of that $50,000, that real revenue. 
and you're going to put that in your profit account. And then you're going to take another 15% and you're going to put that into your tax account. Because remember, Uncle Sam's going to get his taste. You better be prepared to, to give it to him. Then you're going to take 25% of that and you're going to put that in your owner's compensation account. So I'm not really good with math, but 10% in profit, 15% in tax, 25% in owner's comp, that's 50%. So if you have $50,000, half of it is going into those three accounts. Well, what does that mean? What do, you, what do you do with the other half? That goes into your OPEX account. So let's break this down. This is what we're talking about. And let's, yep. let's pause here for just a second because it's this keeps coming up in, in the chat here. What does OPEX stand for? What does that mean? I'm sorry, OPEX or operating expenses. Again, that that is that is the expenses in your business that it takes to actually operate. That's everything outside of your materials and subs. That's your payroll, your utilities, your rent, your insurance, all that stuff, your operation expenses. So you just got a hundred thousand dollar check. Before you did profit first, you thought, awesome, I got $100,000 in my account. We're good. No problem. I take care of payroll. I can get caught up on everything. That we're good. With profit first, you have $25,000 that you can run your business on. But you also have the peace of knowing that all my materials and subs, I've got cash to pay them when I need it. I've got profit, real profit that's in my business. That's cash. That's a cash account that is going to grow over time that allows you to strategically invest into it. You've got, you've got the tax man paid for because if you do not, if when you file your taxes, if you don't have the cash, then you're going to have to do a couple things. One, you're going to have to take cash out of your personal account to inject back into your business. Your business made the profit. Your business created that liability. Your business needs to pay that cash. You shouldn't be responsible for that. Your business should be. And then you've also got surety and confidence that your owner's compensation is taken care of and that you and the family are going to be able to operate your household as you need to. But what does that mean? Going back to Parkinson's law, that means that we have shrunk the amount of cash that your business has to spend. And by doing that, we've put that money elsewhere, all right? So let me tell you a real quick story about owner's compensation and why, that, why I think that this is so important and why Profit First is really, it's a cash management tool, but it's really a peace tool. And I've got a client that, that is in the trades and being in the trades, you, you as an owner probably can sympathize with this. You have seasons that are really, really busy, and you have seasons that you don't get any work just because it's just not out there. And this is a guy that grew up in the trades, like his, his parents had a trade business. And when he got old enough, he, he got into the trade business. And that was the same way. And he said, Greg, during the summer when I was growing up, we'd have steak and lobster. And during the wintertime, we'd have ramen and beanie weenies. It was up and down, up and down, up and down. And so what he did is that when he implemented Profit First, he implemented it during his really, really busy time. So cash was just coming in. But then he put in the discipline for the profit, the tax, the owner's comp, and the opex or operation expense. He put that in and he just had that money. He said, okay, I need to take, you know, in order for me to run my household, in order for me to make my mortgage payments and car payments and all that stuff, I need $3,000 a month. And he knew that he had about four months where he would have no work coming in or very, very little work coming in. And so what he did is that he actually built up a little bit of a nest egg in that owner's co compensation account. And so by the time that it came time to the low season, that he wasn't going to have a lot of work, he actually had six months worth of cash that he needed to pull out. He had $18,000 set aside in that owner's compensation account that he knew that he could pull out $3,000 a month for the next six months. I mean, his slow time was only four months. So he knew that by the time that he would get back to the, the busy season again, he'd still have cash in there. And he said, Greg, this has brought so much peace to me and my family 
because now I'm not stressed about, oh my gosh, how am I going to pay for groceries this week? How am I going to pay for Christmas and not put it on a credit card and then have to worry about next year? How can I? And then the best part about it, he's like, Greg, I've got double that in my tax account and I'm sitting there and I'm waiting for Uncle Sam. I can't wait to do my taxes because if you're, let's, let's say that you've got, let's say you're a million dollar business and you've got 15% in that tax account. That's $150,000. Okay. So million dollars in revenue, you got 15%, $150,000 set aside for Uncle Sam. Well, if your accountant does that voodoo that they do, Maybe, maybe they, maybe the, we peg it right and it's 150000 you get a $150,000 tax bill. You slap high fives with the account says, thanks so much for your service. I'm going to write a check for $150,000 and give it to Uncle Sam. Not going to sweat. Don't have to worry about where the cash is coming from. I've got it. Now, let's say that they, they sit there and they do some more voodoo accounting math and you've got some more depreciation or something. I don't know what it is. I'm not an accountant. But let's say they come back and they say, hey, great news. You only owe $100,000. Well, you've got $150,000 sitting in that account. Guess who just got a bonus? Guess who just got money that they can move over into that profit account? Guess who just got a shot in the arm of cash? You did. Now, let's say that they don't have that depreciation or whatever. You didn't buy anything that they can depreciate or whatever that happens. And they say, hey, I'm so sorry, you owe 175000 Well, you've got 150000 Coming up with 25000 is a hell of a lot easier than coming up with 175000 So it gives peace. Profit first gives peace. And we didn't, and again, it gives peace because you know that all your materials and all your subs are all taken care of. You're not having to worry about when, when the material house gives you a call that they're going to beat you up over your payment because you've got the money to set aside. That's what Profit First does. And it all comes from having these different accounts and having a consistently working out and putting the allocation of cash. Yeah, of course. We all want money in our pocket, do we not? At the end of the year, at the end of the month, we want money in our pockets. That's why we're in business, not to be poor, not to be poor entrepreneurs, right? Let's be rich entrepreneurs and let's do this by implementing this system. I love this. All right, I'll hand it back to you, Greg. So let, let's talk about principle number three, removing temptation. And I talked about when I was, when I was training for the Murph, I didn't have ho-hos and ding-dongs hanging around. I'm not that much of a little Debbie or a hostess. I, I love me some, some uh, French silk pie. I love me some ice cream. But we don't have that in the Martin household. And part of that is just because if it's not if it's not in the refrigerator or freezer, I'm not going to be tempted by it. So this is the same thing. Now you need to understand yourself as an entrepreneur. You know, uh, the way that I describe this is that some entrepreneurs, when it comes to their profit and their tax accounts, some of them like to be able to see that cash going up and, and increasing throughout throughout the months and throughout the, the year. Okay. Some entrepreneurs know that if they see $12,000 sitting in a profit account and they have to make payroll, that they're going to pull money out of that profit account in order to make payroll. Now, let me be real clear. I'm not telling you not to do that. You've got to take care of your people. You've got to have your obligations. You need to run your business so that your reputation is sterling. What I'm telling you is that if that's the case, you, my friend, have an OPEX problem. You have a spending problem. If you can't pay yourself the 25% or whatever your goals are, then you have a spending problem. And as a leader, I'm going to let me get off on a little bit of a tangent. So to, I told you, you know, Chris, we're, we're former military. When you're in the chow line and you're a leader of your squad or your troop or whatever, what, where does the leader eat? Hey, first, man. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, totally, totally wrong. <laughs> Air Force. That's an Air Force answer. <laughs> no, 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 no. Every single leader that I've ever had always eats last. And, and every single person that I know that is a good leader, whether military or not military, that's exactly what they do. Whether they're a leader in their family, whether they're a leader at work, they do things for themselves last. Very, very last. A hundred percent. 
And a lot of entrepreneurs take that and they have a crappy mentality about that. And they're like, well, if I got to pay my guys or I got to pay me, I got to pay my guys. And I just, I guess I'll go without. And again, I'm not saying that that's wrong. That is 100% right. You need to take care of your guys. But then what you need to immediately do is stand up for yourself and realize, you know what? This business is consuming more cash than it should. So where do I find, how can I cut expenses? And this, this is where I talked about the, the concept is very simple, but this is not easy. This is the hardest part. You may have to have a really tough discussion. You may need to, to sell that brand new truck that you got for your foreman or for your crew and go find one that's less expensive. You may have to potentially let somebody go because your business can't afford them. You may have to, all of the niceties and, and the extras and the thing, the benefits of being an entrepreneur, running all the expenses through your business, you may have to pull back on that because your business can't afford it. Are those things wrong? No. I, wa- I want every single one of you to have a fleet of brand new trucks that you buy with cash every year. I want every single one of you, if hunting is, is cool to you, that you've got a deer lease. That maybe that you can, you, now I'm not giving tax advice here at all, but you have a deer lease that your business pays for. I don't know how that's legal, but you know, that's why you have accountants. That you have a country club membership, that you have an airplane, whatever it is that you want. I hope that for you, but I hope that for you in a manner that is profitable and sustainable. And when your business isn't making enough cash, then you have to start asking yourself some very difficult questions. So getting back to removing temptation, if you're that type of entrepreneur that sees $10,000 in an account, in a profit account or a tax account, and you are the one that that are tempted to spend that, then you need to go have what the book calls an inconvenient bank. And that's a bank that has no online presence. It goes in there. there, It's across town. Every town has those small banks that's got like one or two branches and they're way out in the boonies and you can't get to them. Their online access stinks. You know, you can't have debit cards. You're going to go and you're going to open up accounts there. And, and when you put money into your profit temp account, your temporary account, and your tax temporary account, you're going to move that over into that inconvenient bank so that when it comes time to make your tax payments, when it comes time to draw your profit down, we're going to talk about that in a second, that you actually have to drive across town in order to stand in line for 45 minutes, in order to get your money. Because if you've got to go through that much of a pain to get your money, then you're going to think twice about, okay, there's got to be an easier way. And so that's why you remove temptation. You put that money over into the profit hold and a tax hold account. So does that, that make sense? Does that kind of walking through and saying, how can I, I, you have to know yourself but you have to remove the temptation. Okay, so I've, I've got a couple of questions here. First of all, owner's compensation, right? Is that a hard rule on the percentage or is that uh, something that, you know, you, you will adjust? Well, it, it's something that um, I think that you, you need to come up with that in a couple, a couple of ways. One, you need to back yourself into that by saying, okay, what does it really take for me to run my household? If, if you sit there and you do an honest assessment and say, okay, well, I've got to bring home a hundred thousand dollars or a hundred, a hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year in order to run my, in my household, then that means that you're going to have to bring home ten thousand dollars a month in order to do that. So if you're a, if you're a one point two million dollar company, then that's 10%. If you're a $240,000 company, that's 50%. So I'm not saying that that's not possible, but it's probably not possible if you have a $250,000, $240,000 company that you're going to take 50% home. But what I see most of the time with entrepreneurs when they first do this, when they do an assessment and they say, okay, how, how is my company actually looking? It's zero. And, and, and let's, let's, let's kind of take the, materials and subs account off. Let's, let's talk about real revenue, the revenue that you can run your business on. So again, if it's 50%, then, then we're not talking about that. 
uh, we're not talking about your, your top line. Most entrepreneurs that I see, when we look at it, they say, okay, well, Greg, last year, my, my company had 5% net income. And so I'm at 5% profit. And then I would ask them, okay, great. Well, show me where you set that 5% aside. Oh, no, 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 no. I invested that back into the, my business. You got to spend money to make money, man. Uh, and then I would argue, no, you don't have a 5% profit. You have a 0% profit because you didn't set it aside. If you want to reinvest into your business, that's 100% awesome. And that's great. But don't lie to yourself. If you are just spending money and allowing that cash to be consumed by your business and you call it reinvestment because you don't want to call it what it is, overspending, then don't lie to yourself. You're not profitable if, you, if your business has to have that cash to run. So most entrepreneurs I see have zero in the profit account. Most of them have zero in their tax account and they pray to God that they can, they can pull cash off their line of credit or they have cash in their account or they have savings someplace, or that their accountant does a really good job and says that they don't owe any money. So zero profit, zero tax, maybe 10% owner's compensation, and somewhere around 95% OPEX. So your business consumed 105% of what it brought in. Congratulations. <laughs> that's what I see most of the time. And, but that's not sustainable because that you can't do that forever. So what I'm saying is that going back to the question is, okay, how do you come up with that owner's compensation? How do you come up with each one of these percentages? It may start out that it, you're at zero, zero, 10% and 95. Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to figure out how to shrink that 95 down to 90. So at the very least, we're breaking even, you know? And then what we do is we come alongside and we say, okay, if you have a million dollar business. Right now, your business consumes a million dollars in, in expenses. Can you find me 2%? Can you run your business on 98% of that revenue? You run a million dollar business. Can you find a way to run your business on $980,000? I bet you you yeah. can. Absolutely. You and should. you're going to take those 2% and you're going to move 1% over into profit and 1% over into tax. And then what you're going to do is, okay, I can do that. So the next quarter, I'm going to find another 3% and I'm going to move 1% over into profit, 1% over into tax, 1% over into owner's comp. And you're shrinking that plate. You're shrinking the amount of cash that your business can consume because you're disciplined. You're, take, you're sitting there and you're taking a look and it's like, so why does my business have an Amazon subscription, a Netflix subscription, a Hulu subscription, a Disney Plus subscription, an ESPN Plus subscription, a Paramount Plus subscription? It may not be streaming services, but what do you have out there? I, I can't tell you how many times people have said that I've started going through this. And Greg, I saw that for the last five years, we were paying for phones and pagers that we haven't had in 10 years. I mean, we walked in, we picked up the phone, canceled, canceled it with Verizon or Sprint or whoever it was with, and we saved 10 grand a year with one phone call. So it's about sitting there and making your dimes act like dollars. You need to have your dimes act like dollars because by doing that, you are freeing up those extra dimes to go where you want them to go. But you have to have the discipline. And then once you have the discipline of moving them over and, and shrinking the cost and shrinking the amount of cash that your business can consume, then you need to, to not allow temptation to come in and steal it away from you. So if that means having an account in that inconvenient credit union that has terrible service and is two towns away, if that's what it takes to have your money, then you do that because you deserve that. And so the, the percentages will grow over time as you are working through this. So basically, it's like putting your cookies, right? Your ho-hos, your, all the Twinkies in your neighbor's house, right? That, that's right. You're like, hey, store these for me 
Okay. So that you're not constantly going into your pantry and getting those Twinkies and Ho-Hos and cookies and all that kind of stuff. Love it. Yeah. It, it, oh, by the way, my neighbor works at night. So our schedules are always off. And so I can't necessarily, I can't readily go over there at two o'clock in the afternoon and go get some Twinkies because then that's just rude, you know? So I got to sit there and coordinate with them. All right. You're going to be home at, you know, you, you're going to leave work at six o'clock. So I'll meet you at five 30. That means I got to rearrange my day in order to make sure I'm home by five 30. It's a lot of effort instead of just like, forget it. I'll just get it tomorrow. So you have to remove the, remove the temptation. Love it. So here's the deal. This is, this is a system that works, right? This is kind of like, and it, it reminds me of Dave Ramsey, right? You know, have Dave Ramsey, how, 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 you know, you pull all of it and put it in cash, put it in envelopes and all that kind of stuff. But obviously this is not cash. This is not envelopes, right? But, uh, you know, who all wants profit in their business and in their pockets? So put profit in, into the chat, right? Raise your hand here, right? Profit, profit, profit. Absolutely. We all do, right? So this is awesome. A lot of value that we're getting here. And, and when I'm talking about a profit, it's real hard cash. Mm. It's not that profit that you, when you go see your accountant, they say, hey, congratulations, you made $100,000. Oh, by the way, you owe the Uncle Sam 24000 but you made profit of a hundred thousand. That's great. And then you look at your account. You're like, "Bull, where, where the hell is that?" Yeah. Oh no, no, you spent that money already. That was just your book profit. I'm not. When we talk about profit and profit first, we're not talking about book profit. We're not talking about accounting profit. We're talking about cold hard cash. That let's talk about celebrating. All right, so celebrating your victories. What do you do with that profit? So every quarter, if you own Tesla or Duke Energy or whatever stocks, there's a lot of a lot of times that you get a check in the mail every quarter. And that's your dividend check. Why do you get that dividend check? You get that dividend check because the corporation that you invested in said, "We realize that being an owner of this corporation is risky. And we want to say that we appreciate you and we're thankful to you every single quarter by giving you 82 cents for every share that you own. And so thank you so much for taking the risk. Thank you so much for being willing to invest in this company. We made money in the business and we want to say thank you to you. So you give a quarterly distribution. Your company is just like that company. That company may be a little bit bigger than yours, but why in the world do you expect that from a publicly traded company when your company can do the same thing? And so you're setting money aside in that profit account every single time you see it. So if you've got a million dollar business, and let's just say that, that by some miracle, you do $250,000 every single quarter. So every single quarter you're going to have, if you save 10% of that into your profit account, you're going to have $25,000 and you need to celebrate that. That, excuse me, needs to come out in a quarterly distribution. So how, how are you going to spend that distribution? How are you going to work through it? So there's four things that I would look at. First off, you need to have a vault or this needs to be your operational reserve. Every single business out there needs to have an operational reserve. And I say that you need to have somewhere between three and six months of total spend in your business. Now, for a roofer, that might be a little bit, a little bit skewed because obviously 50% of your income goes over into your materials and subs. And you won't have materials and subs costs unless you have jobs. So you may sit there and say, okay, well, if it takes, so if 50% goes over into materials and subs, by the time I make my rent payments, I pay my insurance, I, you know, if I might have loan payments, I make my loan payments. If I spend my utilities and then I've got my office staff and my sales staff, so something that's not associated with the material and subs, and it costs me $5,000 a month to run my business, okay? 
So I would sit there and I would argue that you need to have between three and six months of that. So you need to have between fifteen and thirty thousand dollars sitting in that vault account. That is your break glass in case of emergency. That is your break glass in case COVID thirty two ever hits. How many of you entrepreneurs lived through twenty twenty? February, March, April, May, June of twenty twenty. Mm-hmm. I mean, during that time, I- I'm a banker. My life was consumed with PPP loans at that time. Those are dark old days for everybody involved. How much more peace would you have if you knew that you had $50,000 sitting in that vault account to know, okay, we're going to have to tighten up. We're going to have to, you know, we may not be able to spend all that we normally spend, but I've got runway. I can look to my people with confidence of saying, I've applied for a PPP loan and I think I'll get it. But if I don't get it, I got you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm the leader. This is my family. I've got you. And you had that in the vault. You knew that that was taken care of. So that's what you need to do. Once, once you have, have met or exceeded your three to six months of all-in spend, then the next thing you need to do is you need to get out of debt. I don't care if it's a 2% car loan or a 7% line of credit. You need to get out of debt because when you are in debt, you have somebody or something else telling you how to spend your money. If you come to me, and this is this is coming from a guy that spends a disproportionate amount of my time in my day thinking about putting people in debt. So I I understand where this is coming from. But if you come in, come to me and you borrow a million and a half dollars for your building. And I say, great, that's fantastic. It's just $6,000 a month. Then you have somebody else telling you where to spend $6,000 of your cash every single month. You as an entrepreneur need to understand that financial flexibility is financial freedom. And so get out of debt as soon as you can. And that's a great way to spend your quarterly profit distributions is to pay down debt and to get out of debt. And don't give me the line of, Greg, I'm in debt. I have a loan because I need, the in- I need the interest in order to be written off on my taxes. Well, let's just assume that you are in the highest tax bracket, which right now I think is like 40%. So if you pay $100,000 in interest to the bank or to somebody else, to a financing company, then you're going to be able to write that off. And you'll be able to write that off and reduce your ta- the amount of net income you have. And so you'll save $40,000. Y'all, if you want to give me $100,000 and I'll give you back $40,000, I will do that for as long as you want. As many zeros as you can tack on that, I will do. That is the stupidest reason to go into debt. Can you take advantage of the tax laws? And can you, it, I'm not saying, don't take advantage of the tax laws. What I'm saying is don't go into debt, pay me a dollar to get 40 cents back. So you got your vault taken care of. You're out of debt. So then you could maybe save up and maybe invest back into your company. Maybe there's a new piece of equipment that will allow you to be more profitable. Maybe there's another another truck or trailer or something that you want to buy so that you can have bring out another crew so that you can have more work, that you can be more profitable. Maybe you want to go and, and you're, you're talking to, to someone like Chris and he's like, you know what? We need to have a complete brand overhaul and that may cost fifteen, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 to do that. Well, I don't want to pull that out of my cash stream and pay, but you know what I can do? I can save up over the next three quarters and put money aside. So when it comes time to do that, I've got the cash to invest back in your business. That is what I call investing with purpose. That is what I call investing in your business where it's okay because you've made a strategic decision to invest back in your business. You didn't make the decision to just reinvest in your business by pulling money out of your profit account to to run your business. That's what you do. And if you have a vault, you're out of debt, you don't have any equipment needs or it's strategic investments, then what do you do? Well, you pay yourself that bonus. It's a quarterly distribution. That's where your company comes to you and says, thank you for investing in me. Thank you for being willing to take the risk 
for me. Thank you for being a shareholder and trusting me with your cash. I'm going to give you a little bit back because we made so much. I don't need this in my business to run. I want to thank you. And so then you come and then that's where you celebrate in the household. You, you, you pay down personal debt. You take a vacation. You do whatever you want to do, but it's your business that is bringing that possible to you. How does that sound? I mean, how does that sound to y'all? And I, I know that sounds great to me. Who all wants to go on vacation? I know I do. We all love vacations, right? Or maybe that's to send your kid to Texas A&M. You know, I mean, it's that's that's totally a viable option right there, right? <laughs> uh, we all have kids that are about that's to right. go, go into college, right? Yep. All right. Cool. All right. I, I love this. I love this. I'm getting so much value here, man. I'm one, I'm I'm taking a ton of notes myself. And I know that this is just a huge value to pretty much anyone who is listening to this at this point or or is obviously right here uh on this. But if if you're listening down the road to the podcast and or seeing it on on YouTube, you know, this is a system that works. I actually I have a client, right, that Greg helped here locally here in College Station, Texas. And they said, this system works and it's worked for them really, really, really well. And so much so that they've got enough in, in their profit account to roll over and buy a new truck, brand new truck, first time ever, right? And they're going to they're gonna pay for it straight up cash, right? So I think this system works for sure. And, and before we go on to the last, the last principle, I, I want to say, okay, so one thing that's really unique about your industry uh, roofers and how you do is that you have that super bonus shot of profit at the end of every project called your retainage. Now, not every job has this, but most jobs that I see, most jobs that I help finance have somewhere between a 5, 10, 15% retainage. And so after all of the project is done, if, if you have, if, if you're a roofer and you do a $100,000 job and there's a 10% retainage, then by the time you're done, hopefully you've got 90% or $90,000. And so then you have that extra 10,000 that once the job is complete, now you, you, depending on how the job flows and everything, you're most of the time, you're probably towards like the first third or maybe the half of where you are. Um, depending upon the, the scope of the job. I know that if you're doing a bunch of multifamily deals that, that kind of may work through it. But if you're doing that, you're going to get a bonus of whatever that retainage is when the job's done. So what you can do and how you think through that is what are you, what are you going to do with that? And I've seen this is where Profit First can be customized completely to your business and to your, your, um, your company. You might just treat that as another type of draw. And so 50% goes into mats and subs, and then you do your allocations as, as needed. You might you know, say like, okay, well, I'm going to put 50% over into my materials and subs. And, uh, you know, but the fact of the matter is, is that I've, I've shrunk the amount of cash that my business consumes. So I really don't need that extra money in order to operate. And so 50% goes in materials and subs and 50% goes into profit. And then you do the distribution that way. You know, it's completely up to you, but you have to kind of think through, okay, well, as that hits, how am I going to do that? And that, that's something that, I mean, it, it kind of stinks that you have to wait so long to get that 10% or whatever that retainage is, but it's good because that forces you to have discipline and to work through it. So that, that's one thing. Again, if you want to nerd out on this, we can, we can kind of talk through, but it has to make sense to you. And so that kind of brings me into the last principle is have a have an airborne buddy, have a uh, certified profit first professional. And so these are professionals like me that have gone through um, training. Uh, there's a lot of people out there that says that they can help with prop implementing profit first, but if they are not a certified profit first professional, they are not sanctioned by Mike Michalowicz and his team. You know, most of them are accountants, bookkeepers, or coaches, so they're entrepreneurs like you. And you know what? They bring value and they help you. And so there, there probably is cost associated with having this. But if you can have a guide that comes alongside and helps you find ways that you can shrink the cash, if you can uh, it, cash that your business consumes so that you can save money, 
so that you can have money to pay Uncle Sam, so that you can pay yourself what you deserve to be paid, then that's so valuable. If I can have someone that comes alongside me and help me find a way to get $100,000 of profit in my business, and I got to pay them 15 grand or whatever their fee is to do it, let's talk about it. I'm not saying, I mean, and, and I'm happy to connect you with some of them. There's actually a, a profit first for contractors book out there. So there, there are specifically industry specific books that are written with profit first in mind. If you really want to nerd out on, on that, um, Sean Van Dyke wrote that book. And this is a guy that has worked with contractors in the trades uh, for the majority of his career. And so he kind of understands what it is and, and how it talks through some of the uniqueness that is in the business and the cash flows in your business. Uh, but if you, if you have any questions about it, I'm happy to kind of walk through that. I'm happy to, to serve you and point you in the right direction. If you want to work with a profit first professional and walk through it, I'm happy to connect y'all. So with that, I know that there's a whole lot of information that I threw at you super, super high level. Chris, what, what questions are there? How can I help? First question I see here is, do I have to have that OPEX account or can my income account be the OPEX account? I would say that you have to have that OPEX account. Okay. And, and the reason why I say that, the reason why I say that is that you need to separate the cash into the separate accounts because human nature is that if you have that money just sitting in your income account, then you're going to spend that. And so if the money's in that income account and you've got in, in that $50,000 is your profit portion, your tax portion, your owner's compensation portion, well, then you're going to be tempted to spend all $50,000 in there. Having it, forcing it to be put in that operation account, um, that OPEX account, forces you to have discipline and only spend only what you've allocated for that. Um, and, and I mean, most, most banks that are set up that you can sit there as soon as you make a deposit, the very next day, maybe the, the funds are available to you and you can immediately put it in there. So it's, it's I mean, you're, that in, income account should be at zero for a lot, you know, uh, a lot of days out of the month, you make a deposit, and then the next day it goes back down to zero. Okay, so if it's if it's down to zero, though, right? Won't won't the bank close that account? Mm -mm, no, um, you know, di different banks have different systems and different account types. That's why you go and you talk to your bank and your banker and say, "Look, this account's going to be sitting here at almost zero most of the time," and. I mean, th this is this is not a come to truest. The bank that I work for, this is not. Hey, I you need to come open accounts with me. What I am saying is that there, I know that there are account there are banks out there that say, okay, if you want to have a zero account, uh, zero balance in that account for the majority of the of the month, cool, we can support that. But you have to have those open and honest discussions and make sure that they're not going to charge you a fee to do that. Okay, so another question that uh, I have here is how long does it typically take to see a significant increase in profitability after implementing this system? Oh, well, it depends on how uh, aggressive you are uh, on this. What I would say is that slow and steady wins, wins the race. So let's say that you go and you, you, you do an assessment or you walk through with a profit first professional and you say that I'm at zero profit, zero tax. 20% owner's comp and 80% OPEX. Okay. And again, this is, this is your real revenue. That's after you've moved money aside to pay your materials and subs. All right. So after you've paid your materials and subs, you spend every single dime, excuse me, that, that comes into your business, but you don't set anything aside for profit or tax. Well, you might be tempted to go it was like, well, I can, I can take chop 10% off of that OPEX right away and I'll put 5% into profit, 5% into tax. I got 20% in owner's comp and then 70% in operational expenses. Well, the thing is, is that if you do that and you're too aggressive and you haven't found the areas that you need to cut and, and you cut smartly, 
or, or wisely and, and strategically, then you may overspend and then you're going to have to pull money out of your profit account. Then you're going to have to pull money out of your tax account, which really you're just kind of borrowing from Uncle Sam. Because like I said, he's going to get his taste anyway. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, is that you're too aggressive, then you're psychologically going to damage yourself in this process because you're like, well, it doesn't work. I move that money over the profit account. It doesn't work. I have to pull it back. So forget it. Having all those six accounts is, is hooey. It's too much work. It doesn't work. So that's where I say slow and steady wins the race. Don't start with the 10% cut. Maybe you start with a 2% cut and then you go through a month or two. But the thing is, is that once you start seeing money in that profit account, once you start seeing your cash being stacked up and you're saving that and you are telling the business how to spend your money and then actually and have the business listen to you and you realize that you're spending money on things that don't bring value, then it becomes a game that you want more and more and more and more. So it's really hard to say, okay, how long does it take? What I would say is that you'll start seeing an impact immediately, but don't be too aggressive with it because you want to be implement this for the long haul, not a short-term fix. Love it. Absolutely love that. Okay, next question. Uh, can profit first be used in conjunction with QuickBooks? Yeah, it, it definitely can. And, I, and I'm not a QuickBooks expert, expert, but when you sit there, you can set up multiple accounts in your QuickBooks online uh, or, or your system. And, and it's all cash, all right? And so movement, you know, imagine you, you only had two accounts. You had your spending account, your checking account, and then you had a savings account. Well, that's still cash and moving from one, moving from your checking account to your savings account, that's not revenue. It's just a matter of, of walking through and realizing, okay, well, I've got five different pots of money that I'm going to put my cash in. And from, from an accounting perspective, you know, again, I'm not an accountant, I'm not a bookkeeper, but I, I do know a lot of them that are profit first professionals. And yes, that means that we have six accounts to reconcile every single month versus just the one or the two that you have now. But think about it. I mean, money goes into your income account right now. So all your revenue has to be accounted for. Well, right now, all your money's going into your checking account, so all your money has to be accounted for. Your accountant's just doing that already. And then you're moving, depending, if you get paid once a week, then there's four transactions into your profit, tax, owner's comp, and OPEX, you know? And so it's it's not that many, and then maybe it's four transactions out of the profit account, out of the tax account, into your other, into the, to the remove temptation account. So the number of transactions is very, very, in in most of these accounts is very, very small. Your operating account, your accountant is coming in, your bookkeeper is keeping track of all of those transactions now anyway. So it's, it's, yes, it is more accounts to reconcile, but it's not like you were making seven times as many transactions as you are now. Interesting. All right. One last question here, and it's related and it's my question, right? Something that I wrote down. Okay. You said earlier that you've got three to six months of total spend that you need to keep in vault. Is that total spend from your OPEX account? I would say that's total spend for everything. And and by that is because if you have a, let's say that you um, you have $5,000 a month that you spend on your OPEX to run your business. Mm-hmm. And then you've got an additional $2,000 a month that you have to pay yourself. Um, I see. Yeah. So that you need is, owner's compensation plus OPEX account. Right. So if, if COVID-23 hits us, right, then you've got enough money to pay yourself as well as your employees and all that kind of stuff. 100%. Awesome. And, and make sure that included in that is all of your loan payments, mm-hmm. all your rent payments, all everything and yeah. the reason i specifically say that is because if you were to sit there and look at just your tax return from last year and say okay total expenses on my tax return was 1.2 million dollars or ten thousand dollars a month okay but then you've got four loans that you have to make principal and interest payments each month on well the interest portion of that is on your tax return the principal portion of it is not. So make sure that you're capturing your total spend for your business. Awesome. 
Awesome. All right. Well, that wraps us up. I think if you have any more questions, you can get with uh, Greg here on that or myself, and I will direct you over to Greg. Greg, so speaking of which, if they wanted you to help set up this profit first system, right? And and I know this because you're you're a banker, right? And, and you're in the state of Texas, I think is is the the option there, right? If you're in the state of Texas, you can help them. Is that correct? Yes. And and uh, and again, this is not a, hey, come to Truist and, and bank with us. I want to, I love nerding out with entrepreneurs. I love talking about profitability in your business. So if you just want to call and, and talk through what Profit First would look like in your business, I'd happy to do that. Honestly, I don't care if you come bank with me or not really doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is that you take control of your business and that you become profitable and that you achieve your goals. So from a from a banking standpoint, Truist is able to help serve clients wherever there's wherever there's a Truist footprint. But if you can if you want to get a hold of me, um Chris, I mean definitely you can share my my email. It's Greg at entrebanker dot com or go to www.entrebanker.com. It used to be the entrepreneur's banker, but most entrepreneurs don't know how to spell entrepreneur. So I changed it to entree banker. So that's <laughs> just a little bit easier. <laughs> that's pretty funny. All right. All you entrepreneurs, you've got homework out there. First, implement the profit first system. Number two, figure out how to spell entrepreneur because that's what you are. You should know <laughs> how to spell entrepreneur. So B O S S. <laughs> we hope so, right? At least, at least. Uh, all right. You know, and, and, and I wanted to say this before we started this is that congratulations to y'all that are listening to this, that are here, that are present now because you're working on your business, not working in your business. And it's so important to do that and, and pause and do that on a periodic basis. I know way too many entrepreneurs that let their business run them. How about we take control and let's run our own businesses, all right? Part of that is right here with the Profit First system. The second part is to make sure that your marketing systems are right. Number three is to make sure that you are on entrepreneur's operating system. And you've heard me say that over and over and over again. I'm going to keep beating that 100%. drum. Absolutely. It will change your life. It will change your business and it'll change your lifestyle. All right. With that, I think that we are done here. I'm going to uh, stop recording and I'm going to say bye to everybody here. See y'all next month. And thanks y'all. Love y'all. Thanks. <laughs>